thank you very much for organizing the conference, Erik and Karen, and uh, thank you also very much for the nice talks yesterday, all the days before. It is really a pleasure for me to talk here in front of you all. And of course, congratulations to Dirk. And um, my result I want to present here is a joint work with Harald Gross and Weimar Wulkenhaar. Actually, this model is called Grosse Wulkenhaar model. And the steps or some important steps which were found earlier actually were found on a conference organized by Dirk and Spencer Bloch in Le Juge two years ago, which Weimar already mentioned uh, was a joint work with Erik. And we somehow then generalized it and found also the solution on the four dimensional Moyal space which I have to say is a just renormalizable model. And uh, I guess this is very interesting to have an exact solution, which I want to show you uh, for a just renormalizable model in four dimensions. Okay, let's start. So the outline of the talk is the following. I want to somehow start again with a matrix model, which is yeah, mainly built on what already Thomas and Reimer said. And then I want to make the connection between the Moyal space, which is a non-commutative space, and how it's related to the quartic matrix model. Then I want to formulate and show the renormalized two-point function. So if you do the continuum limit, as Reimer said already in his talk, um, we have to renormalize, of course, everything, field renormalization, mass renormalization, etc. And uh, a final result is that actually this model is non-trivial. So we find really that uh, we are somehow directly on the edge where something is trivial or not trivial. And um, I want to explain or somehow argue why this is not trivial. Um, and uh, this is a very interesting thing and only visible if you have the exact result. So not perturbatively visible. So let's start. So I define the quartic matrix model in the following way. So we have here the space of Hermitian matrices Hn. There are n times n Hermitian matrices and E is one of these Hermitian, uh, one Hermitian matrix with positive eigenvalues, capital E1 up to capital En. And this E should be understood as the Laplacian in momentum space. What does it mean? It means that the eigenvalues are essentially the spectrum of the Laplacian, which is now discrete, but we want to perform a continuum limit where it's a continuous spectrum. And the partition function is defined as an integral over all Hermitian matrices, where we take the exponential of the action, where E, the Laplacian, think of the Laplacian, stands in front of the quadratic term, plus some quartic interaction. And uh, Reimer's definition is uh, exactly equivalent to this definition. He had an integration over the dual space of emission matrices, but uh, okay, I like more this type of definition because it's a little bit yeah, old school, uh, like in the 80s or 70s. Okay, and okay, this integral over all Hermitian n times m matrices, so we have to do here exactly n squared integrals because uh, the space of uh, yeah, uh, degrees of freedom of Hermitian matri matrices is n squared. And we later take the limit to n goes going to infinity. So that means that we actually have here an infinite number of integrals make, which make this not any sense for the partition function, but actually the correlation function will make sense in this limit. So, and uh, I only want to talk today about the two-point correlation function, which is defined as expectation value with phi pq, phi qp, where you see that the eigenvalue of e at p and eq are very important at this point. And um, yeah, we want to calculate that. And how is this related now to the Moyal space? So the definition of the quartic 
model on the non-commutative Moyar space in four dimension is the following. You take the following action where phi is now some Schwarz function. You have here the Laplacian and here you have some regulator, here the mass and here you have the Moyal star product which is a non-commutative product. And here this regulator you had to introduce, this was a uh, work done by uh, Weimar Wolkenhain and Harald Grosse 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago maybe, um, which avoids the infrared and ultraviolet mixing problem. So this is a very important term, which will later somehow go to zero because this theta is actually a matrix, which uh, depends on the deformation parameter of this star product. And we will send this uh, to infinity such that this one over theta goes to zero. Um, but I don't want to go into the details about the Moyal star product. I only want to mention that it has one very important property that it has a metric basis. So if you have some Schwarz function, you can approximate it or even more general functions, you can approximate it inside this metric space. This is what you do. So you write phi of x as phi fn, phi nm times this space, this metric space. In this metric space, you can actually then perform this integral over dx and you end up with only some matrix equation. So where the ens are the eigenvalues here of this Laplacian. Here I have introduced additionally the renormalization, field renormalization. Then these are the coefficients um, in the metric spaces. And uh, here are coupling constant renormalization. And here is the yeah, interacting term. So and what also Weimar did was that we want to have the eigenvalues that they admit some multiplicities. So we say e small e i's are distinct eigenvalues where each of them has the multiplicity ri and especially on the Moya space we have this form of the eigenvalues so we have the new bear so the uh, bear mass and um, here is some of the kinetic part and the eigenvalues or the multiplicity of the eigenvalues is rn is equal to n which means the first eigenvalue occurs once the second twice, the third three times, and so on and so on. So then let's go further. This already Raima have, has shown. This is the nonlinear equation of the two-point function. This is exactly the same what uh, Raima showed before. We are only had to plug in the eigenvalues. And the important point here is that this is, again, I will mention it, this is a nonlinear equation. It is a closed equation. I mean, you express the two-point function by the two-point function, where you here sum out one of the indices. M comes from the multiplicity. And here you have some difference quotient of the two-point function. And here M comes also from the multiplicity. And if you, let's say you want to approximate it by continuous function, you see that also here, if m is equal to p makes somehow sense in a sense of a derivative at that point. So, and then we want to perform the continuum limit. This is now new. Reimer had done everything somehow discrete. Everything is fine in the discrete sense. And we have for discrete, uh, for this discrete version, rational functions, but in the continuum limit, actually something new happens. So if I might mention it shortly that we will take um, two limits or one combined limit where we send N, the size of the matrix, also the deformation parameter of the space of the, Mo of the Moyal space and the biggest eigenvalue ED or the number of eigenvalues with a constant ratio in this limit both to infinity such that this constant ra uh, this ratio is exactly the cutoff of your quantum field theory. So this is the biggest eigenvalue divided by the square root of n. The square root comes from uh, four dimension because you have d over two. And uh, all your um, yeah, discrete numbers then converge to a continuous variable. So you can think of that you have a lot of yeah, discrete numbers which all run together and then form a continuous uh, interval between zero and the coupling uh, and the cutoff. 
and your function also converges to a yeah it's not known at this point if it's continuous but to a function depending on your continuous variables and if this function is continuous we will see it later that it's actually the point and you end up with this integral equation so um, the important point is here maybe that um, the two-point function the first term of the two-point function is the free propagate that goes with one over t so you have dt times t times one over t and this diverges with lambda squared the cutoff and uh, for that you need renormalization so in two dimension for instance you have here instead of dt times t only dt and it was only logarithmically divergent and then you only need the mass renormalization but in that case here you need also the field renormalization and the coupling constant renormalization actually is at the end uh, trivial it's only uh, finite because uh, the uh, beta function is actually zero in this model and all this um, coupling uh, all this renormalization constant are of course depending on the cutoff and then you want to send it to infinity such that everything is finite and before doing that i want to talk about the spectral dimension so we want to say something about the dimension of this model coming from the spectrum of the eigenvalues of e so the asymptotic behavior of the eigenvalues of e um, in this scaling limit i have shown in this continuum limit will uh, define the spectral dimension so we say that rho of x dx is the spectral measure in this limit of the uh, Laplacian. And then you define the um, spectral dimension as follows. So D is defined by the infimum of P such that this integral over the spectral measure converges. So one example is in four dimensions here, we have rho of x is equal x, so you insert here t, t over, and you say four dimension one plus t to the four over two, so t squared, so t over t squared, it, uh, yeah, it diverges with the logarithm, and since you take the infimum, this is exactly four, and for in two dimension, you have here one, and here you have one over t, which is again, logarithmically divergent, and since you take the infimum, it's two. So these are the two uh, spectra on the uh, spectral measures on the Moyal space in two and uh, in two and in four dimensions. Okay, and now we go back to the result Raima has shown. So here um, I don't want to uh, say all the details again, but uh, he has said that the most important thing is to define this function r, which is a rational function. Um, for the discrete case and here again shortly the epsilon n's are defined by the en's which was the eigenvalues and so r of epsilon n is en which defines epsilon and here you have an implicit definition r depends on r prime i even don't know if one can write this as definition <laughs> i guess this is not allowed so and the epsilons are actually the yeah are actually in the physical sheet, one would say, if you use the yeah, notion of uh, topological recursion guys, um, which means that if you send lambda to zero for epsilon n, you end up with e n. So there are also d other epsilon heads with head Rima, uh, which are different pre-images because you, if you multiply by this denominator, everything, you have a polynomial of degree d plus one, and it has d plus one, solutions then and you one is very specific which you call the physical so and what can you do in the continuum limit so actually this is a theorem and i don't want to go into the technical details but this implicit equation converges in the continuum limit for the four dimensional moyal space after taking all this renormalization stuff and so on to this linear integral equation. So you have here something uh, defined implicitly and here you have a linear integral equation. It's a Fredholm equation. And you can maybe see that um, here that comes somehow from uh, something like Taylor subtraction, which is essentially what you can do by uh, renormalization, right? So this part here is exactly this part. 
And if you Taylor subtract somehow twice, you get here a um, yeah, square in T and the integration variable and here Z squared in front. And R of Z is then somehow defined by uh, R of T. And uh, the important point here is that mu is now coming from some boundary condition, some renormalization condition, how you fix the renormalization. And this is later we will see a quite uh, universally or a quite naturally uh, found. And um, at this point, I want, have to mention that on the four dimensional Moyar space, um, we see that the spectral measure is transformed into a effective spectral measure depending on this R function. This comes from how we determine all this solution and how we found this exact solution. Um, and I don't want to talk, to talk about the details, but here you see an effective measure depending on the coupling constant. Okay, and now solve this integral equation. So again, here's the integral equation I want to solve. And uh, what I have used for that is uh, the nice computer program of Erik Hyperint. I mean, if you want to try to um, compute the first orders in lambda, you can go maybe to lambda square, maybe lambda to the three with Mathematica. Uh, but then, then uh, it's the end. But if you use hyperint, in hyperint there's exactly this type of iterated integrals um, implemented that give you the possibility to, to compute that. So we define uh, this function f of x in this way. So to get a little bit rid of this mu. And uh, then you find if you go with hyperint, you can go up to order lambda to the 10, that in the first, 10 orders, this type of series satisfies this equation. So what is the interesting thing of the series? The interesting thing is that we have here um, alternating, um, alternating letters. So this H log is defined here below as uh, iterated integral and here alter only alternating letters. And here also where the first letter is a minus one and um, a lot of zeta two appear or zeta four, so even zeta numbers appear, and you can collect them in an arc sign. Uh, this was very incredible when I found that that you can collect them in an arc sign function. And uh, the natural choice for the boundary condition from mu is exactly by arc sign minus lambda arc sign squared, and uh, the constant here is c. And you can see maybe that this equation f of x satisfy a differential equation of second order. If you derive this once, you have something which has the first letter one and all the rest is alternating. And if you derive this, you have a zero, everything is alternating. So we have uh, shown that this is then later a differential satisfies the differential equation of a second order. And this is solved by a hypergeometric function. So R of x is on the four dimensional Moyar space uh, within infinite deformation parameter, which corresponds to this continuum limit, given by this formula x times 2f1 alpha lambda, 1 minus alpha lambda as parameters, 2 minus x over mu squared, where alpha lambda, in this parameter, you have the coupling constant by arc sine, uh, arc sine of uh, lambda pi. So this is really the important thing, that the coupling constant is hidden here in the parameters. And if you want to now take this result and expand it in lambda, it's very, it's very hard because you can, it's very hard to expand something to expand a hypergeometric function in the arguments. But uh, I mean, this is the solution. And the proof of that is actually not by guessing this thing here, but by knowing that this is the right solution, inserting it in the equation and then finding the right answer. Uh, because I have maybe not so much time, I don't want to go into all the details. So the hypergeometric function uh, can even be generalized by something called Maya G function. A Maya G function is um, an analytic function defined by a contour integral separating two sets of poles. And um, for special yeah, poles, this is actually a hypergeometric function and this Maya G function um, satisfies the convolution, uh, which is exactly here, this type, you can plug in a Maya G function for R and another Maya G function for the denominator here. And then you 
can integrate that and you find again the Maya G function where you somehow then take this contour of the definition and move through one of the poles, you pick up a residue and find exactly the, again, the Maya G function where you have started with comes out, where you actually use um, also for two gamma functions, the Euler reflection identity. So this is very interesting and nice um, calculation. And what you see here is that our result, our model has the convergent radius one over pi because uh, it depends on the arc sign, of course, that you everything can sum to the arc sign of lambda pi. Good, and how is this result now? How is the R of Z related to the two-point function? So here's the important thing that you divide, uh, define another function, I of Z, as minus R of minus mu squared minus the inverse of R. This is what Reimer also tried to say that we need the inverse of this function. And the theorem then says that this part here in red, exactly this part here, is given by y plus this i function and that's it. And then you know this i function and then you can solve the rest because then it's not any more nonlinear because you know what this part is without um, knowing what the two point function is. And the important structure why um, the work of Erik and Reimer was so important is because this i function has a very incredible structure hidden behind it because it's actually more or less an involution. So minus i of minus i of z is actually at the end z. So this is somewhat formal because you have to make sure that you take the right inverses because you have a lot of them in the different sheets or in the different branches. And then that this gives you exactly here the identity, but then you plug it in, this minus cancel, this minus to a plus, this is then canceled and here gets a plus and this is then the identity. And this observation of this structure I gave us the possibility to guess the results and then to prove his work why I actually said was not so hard but you have to know this algebraic structure behind it and yes and what you're left with is with the singular integral equation for the two-point function where the solution theory is known and uh, let's go back to the result of uh, Erik and Weimar what they uh, reached in the conference in Lejouche. So there the R function is, X, uh, is actually very easy, Z plus lambda log of one plus Z. And the inverse can be given in terms of the lambda V function. And if you plug it in this I, so minus R of minus one minus R to the minus one, you end up with this function with the lambda function minus log of one minus the lambda function. And they have computed these two parts separately, but actually they are highly connected by this I of Z. And it's very easy if you know the structure here of I and, and R, you can write it directly down. And they, uh, and I mean, we have generalized it for any arbitrary spectral measure. And this is true there and uh, the proof works out. So, and let's go back to the four dimensional case. So I want to show you the exact result of the two point function. So solving this singular, singular integral equation, which is called of Kalaman type, uh, gives you the two-point function. And this is given by x, y in the continuum limit, ultraviolet convergent, uh, given by x of n. And the n function is defined here. So you have an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of log of your hypergeometric function um, from minus i infinity to plus i infinity. So in the, so some vertical integration in the complex plane closely to uh, the branch point of the hypergeometric function. And this parts here come from renormalization to make everything convergent and so on. And the incredible thing is now, if you expand this result in a small coupling constant, you find hyperlogarithms. And if you compute all the, um, all the Feynman diagrams, use BPH that theorem to renormalize it, you find exactly the same result. So this is really a resummation of all um, Feynman integrals, of all Feynman graphs for a certain type, of course, for the two-point function, planar only, uh, but you can resum them. And the important point is, I mean, the, sum or, or the number of Feynman graphs grows factorially, and you have additionally, if you look per, at perturbation theory, the renormalum problem in this model, which means that 
if you want to compute certain type of graph, the amplitude, if you then send the number of, uh, of the loops to, to, to infinity, this type of graph grows also factorially. So there are the, the, the amplitude of the graph grows, but nevertheless, you have this type of exactly miracle cancellation, which gives you the possibility to resum it at the end. And now I want to end up, do I have a few minutes? Yes, I guess so. Uh, with the spectral dimension of phi to the four. So we have seen that the R function is given by this type of hypergeometric function. And a short lemma says that um, this behaves asymptotically with one over X to the A. If you have here these two coefficients, two parameters and our R function, it means for our R function where you have X times the hypergeometric function uh, behaves asymptotically with X to the one minus alpha lambda where alpha lambda again was the arc sine of lambda pi over pi, which means that the spectral dimension by the definition of the spectral dimension behaves asymptotically with D over two minus one, which means that the effective spectral dimension of this model is four minus two arc sine lambda pi over pi, which means for a positive lambda, you are effectively in a lower dimensional setting. And why does it avoid the triviality problem? Because we need the inverse of R. And the inverse of R is some essential ingredient and it should be globally defined over R plus. On all R plus, you need the bijection. And if you instead would have here another R function, let's say with uh, not de yeah, defined uh, by this linear integral equation, but instead defined by the usual measure, then you would have something which has an upper bound, which behaves with one over lambda. So I mean, for finite lambda, you have an upper, upper bound and you cannot write down the inverse globally, but we are in the nice situation. This R has a global inverse on R plus, and um, which means we have an effective dimension drop, which is only visible by having this exact solution. So if you, would look at perturbation theory, you would never see that this type of effective dimensional drop uh, would come out. And yeah, I want to finish with some open question for the future. So I want to understand how this algebraic structure from the finite results from Weimar, he, he said of our work uh, is in our limit, no more algebraic at the end. So we go from some algebraic results to a limit where you have logarithms, hyperlogarithms or other functions. So um, how, how is this uh, continuum limit working? And there's also the block topological recursion structure true on the four dimensional Moyal space. Um, this is also work in progress uh, where we actually conjecture that this is the same structure. Um, the reason is that in the results of Weimar, you have a lot of this ramification points beta he said he had. And th these betas, the number of these ramification points depend on the number of eigenvalues and you send them to infinity. So you have infinitely many branch points, but actually a very interesting thing happens is all these ramification points come together and accumulate to one point. And it's very incredible how this works and we have not understand it yet. Then I want to understand the structure of this generating series. I mean, every correlation function is a generating series of iterated integrals. And at the end, uh, something quite recent, a recent idea came to me that uh, one can maybe calculate the Galois co-action on our correlation function, which means you assume the transcendental conjecture that all the motivic iterated integrals are the iterated integrals, so the period matters in isomorphism. And then you can compute maybe the Galois co-action on it and look if it's close. And because there's this paper of uh, Erik and Oliver Schnetz where they conjecture it for the fight to the four model for the primitive log diversion graphs. And here you have exact results and can look if this is possible for a quantum or toy quantum field theory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I hope I'm in time. You, you perfectly stuck to your time. <laughs> Congratulations, very well done. Um, we have a question straight away from David Broadhurst. David, 
Yeah, really big congratulations on this very beautiful jump from d equals two to d equals four. Thank you. So, so my question arises from the fact that there's an integer into, uh, halfway between uh, two and four. There are, would naively want to modify your equations by changing your measure to square root of t dt. Uh, you can, yes. Um, this is, is, very, uh, is that a sensible thing to do? And, and what do you get between the conflict hypergeometric function yeah, yeah, equals yeah, to yeah. the Gauss at, uh, um, the, the point is, uh, maybe I can uh, try to write something down. The point is, if you look how we um, computed the results, um, you can have any Hölder continuous measure. And we have a solution theory, how you get for any Hölder continuous measure, exact results. So, I mean, they are not, I mean, you write them down in two implicitly defined functions, but this is valid for any Hölder continuous measure. You can imagine, and only on the d equal two and d equal four case, you have such nice equations. They break down to such equations. Thank you. Uh, I, I had a question at the very end when you refer to the topological recursion, the blob version in four dimensional Moyale and the speculation. Yeah. Now, what is the integral structure in the two dimensional Moyale? Um, it's more or less, uh, I mean, also in two dimension, you want to expect topological recursion. This is um, this important thing, what I want to, uh, maybe I haven't said that, that this underlying structure of topological recursion for this model or blob topological recursion is actually compatible with renormalization. Renormalization does not destroy the structure. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen that already for the Konsevich model, where we also do such kind of continuum limit, but it was too easy too easy to conserve which model. And in that case, we have a lot of these ramification points, but nevertheless, the continuum limit and, renormali um, and renormalization does not destroy the structure. And this is some of the important case. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have, Dirk, please. I have a little question. Your mechanism to avoid triviality, is there anything generic about it? No. No, no, no. Uh, this is uh, very special here for uh, this model. And it was somehow a surprise that we found it. And this is really coming from the fact that this result uh, results are defined implicitly in a system of equations. And uh, I cannot expect to uh, use it somewhere else. OK, OK. All right, uh, let's, let's thank Alex again.